Hello everybody, this is War Story Video Blog, and I am in process interviewing of Thomas Whitman. Hello, Thomas. Hello, Alex. Hello, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. have a great uh, collection room and uh, thank you so much that you agree to say something about your items. Well, I, I am very proud of my collecting room and um, it took me many, many years to find all of the items that I have in it and I've only tried to add what I considered was the best, uh, the rarest, and in fine condition. Mm -hmm. And um, even still today, once or twice a year, I still find something else to put in the room. Mm -hmm. But it is filled up now though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's very good display. Thank you very much. I would like to ask you, when did you start collecting and uh, when did you understand uh, that collecting has become your life? Ah, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. And I think um, all collectors have a, a story. Um, but in my case, uh, I was um, fortunate to have a uncle, um, my uncle Harry, his name was, who was a World War II veteran. And um, he, was, um, he was wounded uh, during the French campaign and he was sent home and he brought home two German daggers. And um, he gave them to my father in the 1950s. And my father put them on the wall in our television room. Um, we, I was just a child then, uh, 10 or 11 years old, something like that. Um, and I had no interest at all in them. Um, but my brother and I, uh, we used to um, take them outside and throw them into trees. Mm. Not good. And um, I still have this dagger was one of the ones that Uncle Harry gave to me. And my brother and I broke the cross guard, throwing it into a tree. Uh oh. So, <laughs> so this is my first dagger. Can I see it? <laughs> it's a WKC. Mm-hmm. With a Tamagawk head. But... Very dark grip. Mm -hmm. But the grip the grip was not that dark when I was a boy. It was yellow. Mm -hmm. And the the uh, celluloid plastic affects is affected by light and it turns color. So that was that was the first dagger along with an SA dagger, mm -hmm. which I have in my case also. So I kept those two daggers. But what happened then, um, in those early years, I was a stamp collector and a coin collector. Mm -hmm. And I used to visit a store uh, to buy these things. Um, and in 1965, I was in that store, and uh, the man that owned the store had this new book that had come out. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the Jim Atwood book. And it was printed in 1965, and he said, look at this. And I opened it up, and I, oh, my God, those are the daggers that we have on our wall at home. And I, I bought the book, and I took it home, and I read it from cover to cover, and then from cover to cover. And it, it really, really excited me. And then I got my dagger out, and I looked in the book, and, oh, that's the same thing. Oh, this is, this is, what, this is history. History, I have a piece of history here. And I became very, very excited about it. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, I wonder how I can get more of these. And um, I started advertising in a local newspaper for war memorabilia. And little by little, I would get phone calls and I would go out and see the people and um, sometimes it was just an old rusty bayonet mm -hmm. uh, after driving 100 miles, you know. But then other times it was another nice army dagger or a navy dagger. 
uh, or a Luftwaffe dagger, and I was able to know what the daggers were mm -hmm. because I had this Atwood book. So the Atwood book started me with the interest mm -hmm. in collecting. And then over the years, after about 10 years, I found out that they had gun shows, that there were some military things at the gun shows. So I went to the gun shows and, and I started to trade some of the daggers that weren't in good shape uh, for ones that are in better shape. Uh, and I began to learn a lot about the hobby, even though I wasn't trying, I was mm -hmm. just doing it. And uh, then people started asking me of questions about it. And I, I thought to myself, wow, I know more about this than anybody else does. Else. And it made me feel good because I think everybody wants to be somebody mm -hmm. in something, yeah. you know? Yes. Uh, we all can't be Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we all can't be the president of the bank. We all can't be the man in charge of the insurance company. Mm -hmm. But ah, Tom Whitman could know about daggers and therefore feel better about myself. Yeah, so uh, uh, that excited me. And then I, I started to do shows myself then mm -hmm. in the um, 70s. And um, I made what I thought was a lot of money in those days. And um, again, uh, that was exciting um, because money is always proof that you are doing well, <laughs> doing well, exactly. So time went on and um, the business got better and better and better. And then I didn't have any time to go to work every day. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I was doing better in the dagger business than I was in the banking business, which was my other job. Mm -hmm. So in 1981, I, I, um, I quit my, my job and um, I started in this business full time. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I never looked back. It's always been um, some years better than others, um, but it's always been very enjoyable. And I've always tried to treat people the way I want to be treated and to be honest. Um, if something is fixed on the dagger, I would always tell people. And, um, and that has always been a, a good thing for my reputation, mm -hmm. uh, which takes a lifetime to build. And you can lose it in a week if yes, you're dishonest, you know. So... Um, that's that's how I became interested in the hobby and eventually um, made it my business. So that's a very interesting story. Thank you, and um, that's very historical thing about. Um, I, I'm talking about this army dagger that it is your um, one of first items that, that I you acquired. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, from my uncle. Yeah. Yes. You author of uh, several books, uh, several famous books about daggers, and um, what started to write all these books? Well, when you when you become a collector, um, and let's just use um, army daggers as an example. Um, when I first started collecting. And in the 60s and the 1970s, 1980s, uh, people just wanted to buy an army dagger, one army dagger, and then they had one for the collection. Mm -hmm. So I was in the business, so I would have 10 or 15 army daggers, and I started to look at them, and they were all army daggers, but yet they were all somewhat different mm -hmm. uh, and I started to look at the cross guards and the pommels and the scabbards and even the grips and little by little I began to realize that if the dagger was made by Carl Eichhorn if you found another Carl Eichhorn dagger it also had the same cross guard mm -hmm. and the same pommel and the same grip and the same scabbard. 
And this fascinated me because I found that there were about 30 different makers of army daggers and each one had their own parts that were made in their factory. And this was fascinating to me, fascinating. So I began to study the different parts and categorize which ones went with which maker mm-hmm. daggers. And, and I thought, well, if I'm interested in this, maybe other people would be too. And I thought that maybe other people would even like to just collect army daggers because they were all different. So why not? Mm -hmm. And it was something that you could buy relatively cheaply. Most people could afford to buy an army dagger. So I thought, why not write a book and try to show the differences? Mm -hmm. And, um, so I, I went about that. I, I, had, I hired a photographer. In those days, they, the ca- they didn't have cameras like we have today where you, you get these wonderful pictures. Uh, I had to hire a professional photographer with a, a $60,000 camera and mm-hmm. all that um, uh, to get good photographs, which to me is very, was very important. If I were going to write a book, the photographs had to be professional with um, things you you could study under a loop if you wanted mm-hmm. to. So uh, I not only wanted a, to write a book on it, but I wanted a book that was um, of expert quality where people could really see what I was trying to show. So mm-hmm. that that's what I did with the Army book, and uh, it took me about a, a one year um, to write it. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and it was very successful. <laughs> and, uh, in what year it was? This was in um, 1995. 1995. That's when I... And prior to that, my friend, Lieutenant Colonel Tom Johnson, who most collectors know, he has a large series of books. And um, he asked me in the um, middle 1980s if I would help him with um, writing chapters for dagger types. Mm -hmm. And um, so I did that, and um, uh, he was very, very pleased with it. And I was pleased that he let me, because he was the most famous man, Mm -hmm. and I still wanted to get famous. (laughs) So uh, I I did that work for him, and um, um, he appreciated it. And since I had done that, it was easier for me to do my first book mm-hmm. by myself. Mm-hmm. See, that's interesting. Yeah, and um, f- first, your first book was uh, was the uh, the army book. Yeah, army book. this is the first the first book, and maybe so that I can I can show you what I'm talking about with um, uh, some of the differences. So if we If we look at this army dagger, uh, this particular dagger was made by Carl Eichhorn. And the cross guard is unique uh, to Carl Eichhorn. Uh, However, they made, that same firm made two other cross guards before this time that are a little different. So there's actually three cross guards that are attributed to Carl Eichhorn but this is the one that we see mostly. And this is true with the scabbard is is unique to them, and so is the pommel. And and just to show you what I'm I'm trying to talk about, if we put this dagger next to the Carl Eichhorn, uh, this dagger was made by um, Holler, F.W. Holler. And if you look at the cross guard compared to the cross guard on the army dagger, you will see that there are differences in the head, in the way the breast feathering is done, and the eagle's wings. It's very subtle, but if you look at it, you can see that there's a difference. Mm -hmm. And then we can show you the same thing with um, uh, this. This dagger was made by the Alcozo firm. 
And you'll also be able to see that there is a difference in that cross guard. And, and also one of the distinctive features about Alcozo too, the uh, pommel is very easy to tell because if you look at this pommel, it flares upward much more than the icorn. Can you see how the lower part is very small and it flares outward uh, to the pommel? Yeah, it's a different yeah. form. Yeah, so if you get used to looking at these things and you study them, you can get to the point where you can, you can see that that's an Alcozo dagger from 10 feet away. Um, and these are all little tiny nuances that you would never even notice or bother with unless you cared about this hobby. And if you care about things like that, it will become um, uh, very enthusing for you and you want to learn more. And um, that's what happened to me. I always wanted to learn more and uh, I dedicated my life to learning as much as I can uh, about um, mostly edged weapons, but I like, I like other things too that were produced during the Third Reich. And I also love um, imperial, German imperial naval daggers that were produced under the Kaiser. Um, and I do other things too, but um, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun when you know what you are doing. So when you go to see some daggers or you go to a show, you're not scared to look at anything or... When somebody gives you a price, you oh, because you, you don't know what you're looking at. But if you do know what you're looking at, uh, it gives you a great sense of satisfaction. Yeah. Uh, and it also allows you to be able to spend mm -hmm. the money, even extra money, for something that you know is a rare feature. Yes, and uh, what will be really good, good investment. Exactly, a, a good investment, and and these these um, edged weapons have always been a good investment, and they will continue to grow in investment. Uh, it's not something you can buy today and expect to make a lot of money in six months. It doesn't doesn't work that way. Yeah. But if you hold something over a period of a decade or so or longer, uh, you will get a better return than you will in any bank. Plus, you have all the fun of owning the items while you have them. Yes, and so, uh, it's a special kind of fun when you have uh, some kind of items that everybody would like to own. <laughs> yeah, um, what Alex is saying, when you, when you have something that's rare, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, people, everybody wants to, wants to see you um, you can be the most terrible person in the world, the ugliest guy, stink and smell, but oh, if you have a rare dagger, yeah. <laughs> everybody, everybody is your friend. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> it's just the way it is, you know, it's funny. <laughs> the, I'll just say, and these uh -huh. features that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm talking about um, are all in my book on, on army daggers, it, it has great photographs and, and beautiful details. See, you can, so you can see exactly what the cross guard is supposed to look like in the, in the pictures. Mm -hmm. And I explain all these differences about scabbards and grips and pommels. And, um, it's a, it's a very interesting thing. Cause then if you, if you buy a dagger and you bring it home and you open my book, and it looks just like the one in the book, you'll know you did good. Yes. Uh, yes if you bought true. a dagger and it doesn't look like the one in the book, uh, maybe you should take it back. Yes, you have to be nervous. <laughs> you have to be nervous, yeah. And um, by the way, I have several items uh, directly from your book uh, that has been published uh, uh, that were years ago. In the book. Yes, oh, yes. that's good, yeah. And um, did you ask uh, another collectors to show you some kind of um, different types of uh, daggers that you 
didn't have uh, during the writing? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, no one can have every type of army dagger that was produced. It's just, um, uh, it, it would be too, it would take a lifetime to find them all. So I had quite a few friends in the hobby and uh, I was able to um, contact them uh, and they sent me pieces that they owned that I could feature in the book. And even though I thought I had gotten 90% of all of the army dagger types, uh, still in the last years since the book was printed, uh, others have appeared that are not in my book. But that's the way the hobby is. Uh, so, um, so the army, the army um, completion of the army hobby is still not done. There mm -hmm. are still more to find. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Uh, another thing when, when I was saying, when I first looked at, at army daggers, um, I found that, that, that most of them had this silver, silver plated fittings. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you would see daggers that had this kind of a, a different plating, which actually is nickel. And I never understood why some daggers had silver plating, some daggers had nickel plating. Uh, and then I learned that uh, when the war started, um, daggers were not the priority for the German government. Uh, the war was, so it was, um, it was necessary to cheapen the materials and the processes um, that were used to make army daggers. So you'll see variations according to the vintage, according to the time when they were made. And then the same is true on the, uh, on the other end. Um, every once in a while, you'll pick up an army dagger that's very heavy and it has a grip that, that is slanted like this. See how it's slanted different mm -hmm. than a normal grip? Yeah. Um, these grips were only used on early produced daggers. Now, army daggers were first produced in 1935. So in the beginning years, uh, the materials were the best that you'll see. Uh, and another thing with these early pieces, this is from a vintage of 1935, you may be able to see on the um, on the camera, you can see brass mm -hmm. coming through the silver plating. Yeah, uh, early early pieces had had all brass cross guard, brass pommel, and even the scabbards were brass and then silver plated. So they're they're very heavy, and they all have unique eagles that were designed by the companies that made them. Uh, and an early army dagger is really, it can be a work of art. Very, mm -hmm. very beautiful. Lots of handwork on them. If the camera can see things here, the, the breast feathering on this eagle, that was all done by someone, a jeweler, chiseling those lines into the breast. And you could just imagine how long that would uh, take to do that yeah, type of work. work. Very hard work. So early daggers are very, very desirable mm -hmm. because of that. Thank you for explaining about Army Daggers and Army Daggers book. And um, I would like to ask about uh, your uh, another books. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you... Well, um, since the Army book was successful, um, collectors wrote me and told me how they uh, learned a lot from it. And um, uh, would there be other books that would explain other daggers. And um, so I started making a study on uh, Luftwaffe daggers, mm -hmm. first model and second model. And I found that just like army daggers, there were also differences in each piece according to who the producer was. So I tried to do the same type of study in the Luftwaffe book uh, as well as the Naval book uh, and also the SS book. Um, the Naval book uh, is also uh, not only Third Reich, uh, but goes back to 1848 when the first um, official Naval dagger was produced. 
So um, uh, there's a lot of um, a lot more history in that naval book than my other books. And the SS book, the field is so vast that um, instead of a book like this, it mm -hmm. winds up to be yeah, a bigger. book like that. And um, I'm currently working on a book on SA and NSKK daggers. And that book is going to be, <laughs> going to be like this. I don't know whether uh, people say, when are you going to get it done, Whitman? Mm -hmm. When is it going to come out? And uh, uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I, uh, I do intend to publish it. And uh, uh, hopefully it'll be within a year or two. Mm -hmm. uh, I have everything done with the photographs and it's all in my head. I just have to sit down and finally mm -hmm. do it. Um, but of course, you can't do your business while you're doing a book. Yes. When you're doing true. a book, your whole life and time have to be devoted to the book. You can't have the phone ring in, and uh, it's so it's very hard to do that. Yes, because um, I have a busy um, a busy company, yeah. and that's uh, good. If you would like to do something well, <laughs> real good work, you have to be all inside this work. Uh, if it if it can't be done well, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's good. And. Um, how long it takes to to write it, to collect all material, and uh, I mean from first uh, book uh, until uh, last book. Many, until... many years. Mm -hmm. um, I'm fortunate in my business, I see a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, and when I see something that's special, uh, I have photographs made of it, and I store the photographs. When I find um, photographs showing edge weapons in wear, um, I have them photographed and I save them. Mm -hmm. And um, for instance, the, the SS book has material in it that I um, started saving 40 years ago. So no book can be written in six yeah. months because it's years of uh, always thinking that maybe someday uh, this material would be of use, and, yeah. and, it, and it was, yeah. And you know, now uh, it's a little bit easier to collect material, to collect uh, photographs or something like that, because um, I have uh, some base uh, on internet, and uh, all pictures I, I have to put uh, on this base about mm -hmm. Luftwaffe daggers, about um, army daggers. But from what you say, too, um, the internet and the um, the new cameras that we have today mm -hmm. have um, completely changed uh, the methods of research mm -hmm. and gaining material today. Um, yeah, that's what the, I mean. Yeah, uh, today uh, you can look on the internet and see fabulous things that would have been impossible mm -hmm. for me to find in the days that I was first doing these books. Mm -hmm. um, you had to sit down and write a letter, send it, wait a week for somebody to get it, another week for them to, mm -hmm. and it, it just took eternity. Yeah. And to photograph anything, you had to take everything over to the photographer and stay with him all day while he, and show him what to, to, to picture or else yeah. you got the wrong thing. Um, I remember once as an example of that, I, I had a nice Himmler dagger and I took it over to the photographer and I said, look, I want you to take a mm -hmm. picture of the inscription, um, but I don't have time to stay here. Just do it and then I'll come back. Mm -hmm. So I came back at the end of the day. Oh, I got a wonderful picture of the inscription and I look at it. Meine Ehre heißt Troja. He didn't take the others. <laughs> yeah. So this I, is, yeah. I had uh, the several story about Rom Dagger. <laughs> yes. Yeah. They say Rom Dagger. And um, last question about, um, about the books. In case you will uh, reprint your book, will you add some, uh, any new information inside? Yes. Uh, as, I, as I learn new information, mm -hmm. uh, I am saving it. Uh, and if the time comes where I reprint my books, I will reprint them with the new information. Mm -hmm. um, and that time 
may be fairly close because I'm starting to run out of books now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm near the end of them now. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, it was very interesting. And uh, thank you for showing all these things. Uh, it's very interesting. I have to take better pictures for uh, subscribers for to show all uh, these things in uh, small details. And um, thank you very much for all subscribers that you saw this interview until the end. And I hope it is not last hour interview. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, um, it's my pleasure. And uh, I've always felt that your collection has to be shared. <laughs> uh, just to have it yourself and <laughs> nobody's allowed to see it. Um, yes. That is not fun. Part of the fun of collecting, I've always felt that um, if you can share the things with others so that everyone can get pleasure out of it. Yeah. Uh, I don't understand people that um, they buy things and uh, they put them in bank vaults uh, <laughs> and they never see them. And this is why I like to have my um, collection on display. Um, I come in here every morning before I go down to my office because it makes me feel good. Uh, yeah. And I like to, um, to show collectors my collection too. And uh, then they feel good. And sometimes they buy something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. The theme story. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank You're you welcome. for sharing. It's my pleasure. Thank you, yeah. Alex. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah.